that's the fascinating thing about alcohol and drugs is I did them thousands and thousands of times and every time they made me sick. But I kept going back to them. And I think that also applies to people in toxic relationships or even toxic thinking, or it's that horrifying paradoxical question of why are we so compulsively attached to the things that empirically are so bad for us? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. And guess what? It is Dotsie and me this week. Dotsie, welcome back. You were at the Olympics in Paris. I want to hear all about it because you weren't there just playing. You were there working. I was a little bit, but I mean, it was mostly play. Let's be honest. It was really a, a wonderful time for Kirk and I to, to step out and unplug and um, and just have a bit of a vacation, which Paris might be one of the most magical cities to have a vacation in. There's so much to do and see. And we just, we really just leaned into like large, long Parisian breakfasts in our um, on the rooftop of our Airbnb, like vegan cheeses and all these different fresh breads and olives and figs. And, you know, we just were, we just leaned into the whole Euro vibe and uh, we did some museums. We did some uh, virtual reality museums. Even that was crazy. We did some fashion. We did um, a, a wine masterclass. We rented bikes and rode to Versailles. Uh, so we just we just had the best time, but we did go to five different events, um, Olympic events, and it was just it was a magical experience, including my own event, which Team USA won gold in. So that was I watched that on TV too, just because I knew it was your Yay. that's track cycling, everybody. Um, yes, and... yeah. So tell us the other events you went to and tell us about the Olympics and whether it truly was you felt greener than certainly the London Olympics that you experienced and how were the vegan venues? Yeah. <laughs> well, we can't no we cannot call them vegan venues. I'm going to uh get everyone up to speed on on what it was like and then what we're going to do for uh help uh assist LA 2028 in doing um, but so for, from an athlete perspective, I wasn't in the athlete village, but there were some reports early on that there just wasn't enough food in general for the athletes, which is, you know, I think kind of little, little lame. Cause it's not like they didn't know how many athletes to the exact number were going to show up, uh, in the athlete village. So that was a little rough. I think probably, uh, one of the reasons was, uh, because of their sustainability commitments, they had promised to have, um, like 80% of their food come from within 50 miles of Paris. And I think maybe that just was not uh, practical, right? They just couldn't get enough food in uh, with, with with that parameter. And so I, I believe they loosened that up. And within 48 hours, we weren't hearing, hearing any more complaints from, from the athlete village. They didn't have enough food. And they always have to provide uh, extraordinary variety of food for the athletes because they're from all over the world with all sorts of different traditions. Um and diets. So they had everything under the sun, just like they, they did in London. And, and that's, that's important for the athletes. You can't ask athletes to change their diet, uh, when they arrive for the Olympic games. So, uh, but there's only about 11,000 Olympic athlete summer athletes there's in the winter games, it's about 7,500. So that is a very small amount compared to the amount of spectators there, which about 15 million people ascended on uh, Paris for the Olympic games. So what do we feed 15 million people? And that's where Paris uh, made the commitment and announced it. Uh, I'd say they announced it about nine to 10 months before the Olympic games, that it was going to be 60% plant-based Olympics because of the sustainability and green pledges that they had made um, as a Olympic organization. Does this mean that when you go, it, it applies to not around the city, but no, when, right. At the Olympic events. So all it, right. All of the stadiums and, and um, yeah, Olympic venues and the food that they're going to be serving these 15 million people over a little over two weeks. Right. So not like restaurants or anything. Um, although the, the restaurant vegan scene is off the charts in Paris. Like we ate like Kings. It was just outstanding. I mean, really, really high end all the way to um, bakeries, big 
massive bakeries that are just gorgeous with everything you would want, right? The pan de chocolates and all the quiches and everything, all 100% vegan. So the the food outside the venues <laughs> in Paris proper was extraordinary. And I would suggest anyone, because you kind of think, oh, if you could, I'm going to go to Paris as a vegan. Oh, it's going to be really hard. You just imagine because how committed I'll say they are to uh, their cheese and, and their dairy. But you know, the Parisians are also uh, very snotty about their food in a good way. Uh, you know, they really, they, they, they hold it up in high esteem. And so I think the vegan chefs and the vegan uh, folks that are in the food industry that, that live there, they know that in order to stay in business, they, they have to, to kind of meet that upper crust standard that the Parisians have about their food. So it was like the best vegan food I've ever had in my whole life was in Paris by a long shot. So it was just like pretty mind blowing. But back to the spectators at the Olympics and the venues, I went to five different venues, which is swimming and rowing and track and field and track cycling. And um, they had a, a couple of menu items that they called plant-based and they were very um, mouthy about, you know, letting you know it was, it was plant-based. And lo and behold, Alexandra, every single item that they called plant-based had meat or eggs, I mean, sorry, that didn't have meat in, in it, um, had eggs and or dairy all over the food, like dripping in it. So they had no plant-based food. They had 0% plant-based food, zero. I mean, I, I, yeah, I was, I was. Well, first at the first venue that we went to was swimming. And I was like, we didn't bring any food because we were so excited. We're like, we're going to be able to get the vegan food at these venues. No. So we just starved that night and we brought our own food the rest of the time. But I mean, I was, Kirk and I were walking around to, to, to each of the areas where they were serving food, seeing if there's anything different. I mean, we did a deep dive. Um, so, um, they were, very, I'm really disappointed, very disingenuous because they announced this and then they really kind of pushed it in the media. Um, and, uh, it's a lie. I, I even found myself, Alexandra, like on Google, like, do I not know the definition of plant-based? Is that not like, let me just, what's happening right now? Yeah, no, it means made of entirely of plants. Um, so, so yeah, so we got a lot of work to do, um, but LA 2028 gets it. They're very committed. They're going to want to beat Paris as far as the sustainability, because Paris did a lot of other things besides just food to make it a sustainable um, and greener Olympics, but LA is off to a great start. I mean, they're not building any new buildings. It's the first Olympic games in history that hasn't done that. They're using all existing venues and they're very serious about the food. I think they'll announce, you know, somewhere in the category of 90, 80 or 90% plant-based and it will truly be plant-based food. So we have something to look forward to in 2028. <laughs> Great, great. And, and switch for good will be in the, in the mix there, uh, putting pressure on them. Yes. To yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, not even pressure. I mean, we we we've been we met with the sustainability director of 2028 for uh, almost a year and a half, and 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 uh, leading just you know because you you know eight years out that you've won the bid. So, uh, but then she left and retired, and there's a a, a new person in who we've been discussing, and then we kind of ceased the conversations leading into Paris because you know they were you know it's, it's all hands on deck for the the next Olympics, right? To, to so they were in Paris and um, and learning, but we're we'll be sitting back down with them and making actual plans uh, here within the next month or two, as we're obviously four years out. <laughs> Now, there was one other thing I mentioned on one of the show episodes uh, when you were in Paris, and that was the billboards that Switch for Good uh, created. Tell us what happened. I told said a little bit, but I know it's a fuller picture. Yeah. Well, in a long story short, we just um, we were silenced by the Paris government. We, we had um, uh, four different billboards. They were all uh, kind of around the idea of, of, of drop milk wind metals. And, you know, of course we had it all referenced with the hardest, uh, hard science and the best science. And, um, we were going to do 200, uh, six feet by four feet posters in the Metro, because as you know, Europe is all trains and, and, and metros and subways as far as, um, getting anywhere. So, 
Uh, but almost, I felt like almost the final hour, uh, it really did. It was only a couple of weeks before they were to be printed. Um, it had to pass through uh, a, a variety of folks and and the, the, it ended up being the, the government that they they literally, quite literally said um, that they don't want to uh, upset the members of the dairy industry, which I thought was telling that they were being so honest. I think the, the U.S. would probably not be so forthright that they're scared of the dairy industry, <laughs> but that's basically, you know, uh, exactly what they said. And so they said, no, we're not taking them. Like then they, and they wired us back our money. So we took, we took um, the campaign to digital and with today's, you know, digital system um, and AI, you can target whoever you want in the world and and so we literally were able to target all of the people in Paris going to Olympic events on their phones in the metro. So they saw it on their phones versus on the wall. So we, we and then we we also grabbed some other audiences that were important to us that we thought would be, um, you know, uh, lean into the ads and be interested in um, the knowledge and the science. And so uh, and it's been one of our most successful ad campaigns. It's still running because the Paralympics start in just a matter of days. So we that's and those will go for two weeks. So anyway, th thank thanks for thanks for asking. But you know, sometimes we have a, a a wonderful human here that runs all of our um events, and she's always saying it happened for us, not to us. You know, because you go like, why did such and such happen? Whatever happens to you at any given day, and I always remember that because usually why it happened for you is not revealed immediately. So when we got the news that. The, the government said no, we were really disappointed, but we, all of us kept hope alive, you know, like, okay, why did this happen? Did it happen for us? Did it happen? And, and, I, I, and we're, reach, we're reaching a much wider audience digitally than we would have in the Paris Metro. So there you go. It happened for us. Wow. What a great, what a great um, thing, story to remember. So thanks. Uh, listen, our, Moby's going to be coming on in a moment. Dotsie. I know. I know. <laughs> yes. He's going to be here in in any second. So I just want to tell people, I realized that our our fabulous podcast audience needs to know about this. Um, it is a one day event and summit on plant based human performance. Um, it's called Project Adapt, and it is a collaboration between Switch for Good and the wonderful Plantrition Project that I think many of our listeners know about. It is Thursday, September nineteenth. And it is Anaheim, in Anaheim at the Anaheim Marriott. We'll, we'll definitely put the link in the show notes. But if you're anywhere in the Southern California area, or if you feel like flying in for it, um, the Plantrition Project Conference is happening directly after. So the 20th, 21st, and 22nd. So Project Adapt is just September 19th. So even if you are maybe coming in from out of town for Plantrition, Take a look at Adapt so that you can sign up for that Thursday. And Alexandra, literally every single speaker um, has been on our podcast. We've got Dr. Jim Loomis. We've got Angie Sadeghi, Dean Sherzai, uh, Scott Stoll, myself. So uh, all those wonderful humans. We know how, how full all of them are with so much information. Um, and this is really... Uh, instead of disease mitigation, which is plantrition projects focus, this is optimum human performance on plants. So anyway, we'll put it in the show notes if people want to join. Fantastic. And if y'all want to meet Dotsie in person, you need to go there. <laughs> yeah, come see me. Come hang out. It'd be awesome. All right. Good stuff. Well, folks, today we have the honor of hosting a true icon in the world of music and culture. One might even argue that he crafted the very soundtrack of a generation. Whether through its groundbreaking contributions to electronic music with albums like Play and 18, iconic songs like Natural Blues, Why Does My Heart Feel So Bad, and One of Those Mornings, or his unforgettable tracks in films like The Beach, Heat, and The Born Identity, Moby's influence is truly undeniable. With over 20 million albums sold worldwide, he is a visionary who has continually pushed the boundaries of what music can be, touching millions and transcending genres. And Moby's influence reaches far beyond his music, as most of you know. He is an author and a filmmaker and a committed vegan for over 30 plus years. He's a leading advocate for animal rights 
and environmental environmental sustainability. And he has donated proceeds from tours and albums like All Visible Object, Objects to these causes and promotes veganism and ethical living through public speaking, including his TED Talk, if you haven't seen it, on why he's a vegan, motivating others to reflect on the impact of their choices on the planet and its precious inhabitants. So sit back, relax, and prepare, because we're going to be inspired as we dive into the mind and the world of one of the greatest artists of our time. Thanks for coming to hang with us, Moby. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, for sure. Oh my gosh, there's a, a million places that we can start, but I... I have a question that's maybe kind of large and we can, um, you know, kind of trickle down from there, but I'm very curious on, did becoming vegan change your art? Does it, did it change your approach to your art and to your music? And if so, how? Well, it's a great question. Um, and I, because I've been a vegan now for 37 years and I've been making music since I was nine. So my math is not great, but that means I've been making music for approximately 50 years. And in the course of that time, I mean, so, I mean, to put it in perspective, I started playing guitar when Jimmy Carter was president. So that's how far back it goes. And I mean, so many things over the years have affected how I perceive life, how I perceive art, how I perceive myself, how I perceive the world around me. I mean, I, I know that's probably true for most people who've been around for a minute, but in terms of veganism affecting creativity, it did much later. And what I mean by that, and I don't want to jump ahead too far, is uh, in 2008, I got sober and that was the big turning point. You know, like, because pre-sobriety, I was very committed to hedonism and selfishness and entitlement. And after sobriety, I almost had to reinvent myself, you know, in an existential way. And that's when veganism really rose for me. I mean, I'd always been a vegan, but it, that's when it really rose to prominence, at least in how, like, what my worldview was. Okay. And, and, and is that is that really when your activism started showing up? Like you're, I'm going to fight for this because you're not, like you said, the hedonism was such a part of not being sober, but now you were, you know, darting your eyes on, on something that was larger than yourself. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a psychological aspect to it. Um, and I don't want to ramble on too much about this because it's probably only interesting to me but I'll try and give uh, the sort of truncated edited version. Which no, no, is, no, just, just open it up. I think it's interesting. Okay. Yes. Well, I mean, we're all trying to make sense of ourselves. We're all trying to make sense of the world in which we live. We're all dealing with past trauma and we're all dealing with confusion because we live in a 15 billion year old universe and we don't know if our lives have meaning or significance. And at least for me, because I was raised with a lot of chaos, that from an early age, I really looked at things that gave me a sense of peace and control, but that also, you know, like many people, things that made me feel good, things that validated me, things that sort of buttressed my insecurities. And that's what led to, for me, alcohol and drug addiction. You know, like I, it was a way to control my neurochemistry. It was a way to control my feelings. And it was very selfish and very self-destructive. And when that came to an end in October of 2008, I was sort of left with this blank slate. I was like, okay, I know that secular selfishness doesn't work for me. You know, I could argue it doesn't work for anyone, but I know for me, I tried it over and over again and it didn't work. And so I was left with this question, well, then you're alive. So what does work? You know, what actually has meaning potentially? What is important? And I sort of came down to three things. And again, I don't know if this I'm jumping way ahead in what we want to talk about. But by ha not having... Um like it not being for you, d does that mean to you that it just, it just wasn't, it just wasn't fulfilling the hedonistic way? 
Like it wasn't working, you said. Was it is is that why? It's the paradox of selfishness. And it makes me think of when I was growing up, there's a you know, like everybody of a certain age, I grew up watching a lot of Bugs Bunny cartoons. And there's one in particular where I think Bugs and Daffy Duck find a treasure. They find a cave filled with treasure. And Daffy Duck is out of control with selfishness and it destroys him. If you remember the last scene, he's been shrunk to the size of a fingernail and he's holding on to a pearl in an oyster saying, mine, mine, mine. And to me, that's selfishness. You know, that's hedonism. That's addiction where you're just focused on yourself. You're just focused on what feels good right now and what validates you right now. And the paradox, the irony of it is it doesn't work. You know, at least it didn't work for me and it doesn't seem to work. I don't know anyone who has pursued selfishness who's ended up with lasting happiness. I mean, I, I'm waiting to meet that person, but it seems like the more that people pursue selfishness, the more it drives them crazy. The more it dr- like, because you can never get enough. You can never, you know, your selfishness and your hedonism, it's never going to protect you from age. It's never going to protect you from mortality. It's never going to protect you from life. And so what happened with me is when I got sober, I, like I said, I was left with this blank slate and left with the question of, okay, what works? Like, I know what doesn't work. Hedonism, materialism, selfishness, like these things simply didn't work. Meaning they didn't make me happy and they made me selfish and they made me entitled and they clearly didn't benefit anyone around me. So it was very easy in a way to give up that level of selfishness and addiction. But then I asked myself, what did work empirically speaking? And I sort of came up with three things. And those three things were creativity, nature, and animals. And creativity for me stopped being a job and just started being a joyful celebration and a form of refuge. You know, like I stopped thinking of selling records. I stopped thinking of selling tickets. And I just loved the act of creation, whether it's books or movies or TV or animation or music, just making things came with so much joy. And then the, we'll call it nature and science. To me, that was my way of saying, okay, the the universe is so big and so complicated and so fascinating and i personally love examining it i don't think we can figure it out but like examining that and then lastly if not firstly on my list of things that work was animal rights and animal activism where you know as you guys know as i assume a lot of your listeners know like animals exist in a state of grace and innocence And it is arguably the single worst thing that humans do is taking advantage of that state of grace and innocence and, you know, being violent towards the defenseless, being violent towards the vulnerable. And to me, that just seems like that just seems wrong. And so I decided my first priority is to try and address that and try and move the needle away from that so that simply there is less suffering in the world because it's hard to find someone who thinks that the world needs more suffering. In your documentary, Moby Doc, which by the way, was supremely creative, speaking of creativity and very uh, informative about you in such a diverse ways. Um, so congratulations on that. I, I, I really felt like I got to know you so much better. You you mentioned that your love of animals came because your life was so chaotic as a child that your that animals were peaceful. They they gave you peace. And is that what drew you to animal rights as opposed to civil rights or something else? Yeah, I mean, and obviously, maybe not obviously, but it goes without saying that I fully support civil rights, gender rights, women's rights, you know, environmental rights, indigenous rights, like all those are, of course, incredibly important. And the fascinating thing about animal rights is it informs all of those, you know, regarding health, regarding environment, regarding exposure to toxins, regarding, you know, like 
regarding workplace safety, et cetera, et cetera, like animal rights in a world without animal agriculture, without meat and dairy, all of those rights would, all, all of those, those groups of sort of at, at times marginalized or disenfranchised people, they would all benefit. So I see animal rights as actually being the first step towards really benefiting a lot of other people as well. But yes, to your point, at a very early age, I, my brain sort of decided based on experience that humans were dangerous. Humans were unpredictable. Humans, you couldn't figure out what they were going to do next. You know, like when I was growing up, my parents were fighting, you know, one minute they'd be in love, the next minute they were fighting, one minute they'd be peaceful, the next minute they'd be violent. And as a little kid, I couldn't make sense of that. I couldn't figure out why they were so mercurial. But I looked at our animals because I grew up in this, we grew up in a basement apartment in Harlem where there were so many animals. We had rescued lab rats and we had dogs and we had cats. We had this menagerie and the animals simply made sense to me. You know, like they never got angry without a reason. They never were violent. They never, they never seemed irrational to me, whereas the humans made absolutely no sense to me. It still continues to this day. So I would say that for me was definitely the beginning of my interest in animal rights, just recognizing the sort of almost like the predictable, rational decency of animals. That, that's, that's pretty forward thinking. It still would be rescued lab rats. How, how did your mom or dad know how they could rescue lab well, rats? My dad was going to Columbia and I think he was a, a TA and then maybe, well, he worked in the chemistry department at Columbia University. Okay. And I think, Anybody who works in a lab like that has that experience where like maybe they're experimenting on animals, which as we all know is bad science, but they're experimenting on the animals. And when the experiment's over, they're told to kill the animals, even the control animals who weren't maybe exposed to the whatever medication or right, whatever or they're toxin. testing. Yeah. yeah. So he looked at these innocent lab rats who he had been feeding, who he'd been caring for, and rather than kill them, he brought them home. So I grew wow. up with a little menagerie of lab rats. <laughs> That's so awesome. <laughs> you mentioned your sobriety. Um, I think a lot of, certainly Dotsie and I, having struggled with addiction and um, a lot of our audience is always interested of how people overcome addictions or just habits, bad habits. I don't mean to minimize your addiction, but some people might not be addicted, but they still could feel like they can learn from someone like you who drank up to 20 beers a night sometimes. What was it that after so many, several decades of struggling that you decided to stop? Why did you decide to stop? What, what was the catalyst and how did you do it? Yeah, it's, it's funny because it's such a good question and it's such a, a paradoxical question. For example, if I hit my hand with a hammer once, there's a good chance I'm never going to do it again because it's unpleasant. You know, if I eat some deep fried vegan food and it disagrees with me, there's a good chance I'll never do it again. That's the fascinating thing about alcohol and drugs is I did them thousands and thousands of times and every time they made me sick. But I kept going back to them. And I think that also applies to people in toxic relationships or even toxic thinking or there, there's so it's it's that horrifying paradoxical question of why are we so compulsively attached to the things that empirically are so bad for us? And uh, I wish I had some wonderful insight as to that because I I don't know. I mean, you could argue it's archetypal. There maybe there's some Jungian elements to it. I don't. I fully don't know. A friend of mine's going through it right now. Like she's in a relationship where it's terrible. She's in a terrible, toxic, awful relationship and she can't leave. So she's rationally aware it's terrible, but she can't leave. But does it feel so good when it's good? Like those toxic relationships usually have the highs and the lows, just like alcohol or drugs have the highs and the lows. Like they're chasing that when it's good, it's so good. I mean, you chase your first high and never feel, or it's works in the beginning and then it stops working, but you're in a habit loop. 
Yeah, and you stop, at least for me, with alcohol and drugs especially, I just, I simply came to rely on them. You know, I, it was how I was able to socialize. It was how I was able to date. It was how I was able to do everything. It became my organizing principle, essentially. And, you know, maybe there's that one big variable of what keeps people in any sort of toxic, addictive, obsessive relationship is the inability to see what life would be like without it. You know, because like when I was looking towards the end of my drinking and doing drugs, I didn't even really like it anymore, but it was so familiar. I couldn't imagine how I would function without it. And I got lucky. I mean, like, this might sound strange, but in a way, I'm incredibly grateful to be an alcoholic and a drug addict because compared to a lot of other obsessions or addictions, it's a very easy one to move past. And what I mean by that is it's, for me, it's you have to give it up completely. Whereas the, the addictions that I think are a lot harder and a lot more insidious are love addiction, overeating, overspending. Like these one, you can't give up eating. You can't give up spending. Like you can't go, you can't be sober, you know, completely from eating or spending or having relationships. Those are the hard ones where you have to moderate the thing you're essentially addicted to. And so I'm, I feel really lucky that for me with alcohol and drugs, I just reached the point where I was like, oh, I have been hung over a few thousand times. My health is suffering. And every time I drink and do drugs, I end up sick and miserable and sometimes suicidal. Clearly this isn't working. And I was just confronted with that overwhelming mountain of evidence. And I went to AA and I stopped. It was a very, in a way it was hard, but it was very simple in how binary it was. Like one minute you're drinking and doing drugs, the next minute you're not, you give it up. As opposed to, again, like my heart really goes out to the people who are wrestling with the, what I call the maintenance addictions. Like I have a friend who's battling with overeating and she just keeps going back to it because you have to keep eating. And if, I, if someone said to me, I had to keep drinking for the rest of my life, I don't know how I do it. Yeah, I can speak from personal experience and as a, a former anorexic, it is crazy. It is, it is just, you, you, it's like literally it faces you within hours that you have to put something in as you're going through the healing journey, whether you're an inpatient or outpatient or however it is. And um, I appreciate your, you recognizing that. I don't think about that as often. I tend to clump gl them all together, even though my challenge was, uh, was anorexia and, and, and is refeeding right? It's literally what they call it. It's a, it's a, it, it, it's a, it's such a challenging journey to be able to take those bites. And, uh, but gosh, it really puts you right in the center of yourself and uh, taught me so much about feeling my feelings and being integrated and in, in my own spirit and in my own life and in my own existence in every single minute of every day. And I can go back to that uh, those, um, healing modalities that have nothing to do with, you know, anorexia, but just have to do with being right here. And, and so I'm, I'm grateful for that. In the years it's been, uh, so let me do some quick math, uh, it's 16 years that you've been sober. Um, have you felt like going back and was that because was there some emotional thing that happened to you that made you think, oh, if I could, so I could feel better at least if I went back. Well, tell us about your, the journey after your, you got. You know, it's funny. Um, I had early on in sobriety and I had maybe like even two weeks sober. I was living in New York and it, boy, oh boy, getting sober in New York is a very challenging thing. That's one of the reasons I moved to LA because I lived in the Lower East Side, surrounded by bars, surrounded by people going out until four o'clock in the morning. And being sober in that environment was truly challenging. And there was one night, this was so fascinating. Uh, I was in a bar with some friends and I was newly sober and I was so bored. I was bored and I was depressed and I was lonely and I knew that if I drank, I would no longer be bored, I'd no longer be depressed, and I'd no longer be lonely, except I would then 
be hung over and sick in the morning and the cycle would continue. So I was like, okay, what should I do? What should I do? Maybe I just give in to the addiction and drink myself to death. Like it was a really a moment of like, maybe I can't be sober. And I was going to go to the bar and get a drink. And the most remarkable thing happened. And I don't know who or what the divine might be, but in, before I went to the bar, and I'm not making this up, I went to the bar, I went to the bathroom, and I walked into the bathroom, and there on the wall in the bathroom, painted in gold graffiti pen, it said, trust your struggle. And in, and in that moment, I was like, that wasn't what I was like, the message wasn't don't drink, the message wasn't look after yourself, or remember, it wasn't some AA cliche, it was trust your struggle. And that was the, that was exactly what I needed to hear. So that moment, that felt, I don't know who, again, it could just be random coincidence, but it felt like, oh, I've just been put in front of the exact three words I needed to hear. Um, and honestly, the only other time in sobriety I was tempted to drink was when I first moved to LA, I was going through a breakup and I was in a bar with some friends and I saw a glass of vodka and it looked really good but I didn't drink, you know? So I had this one moment of like, oh, that looks good, but then never thought of it again. You mentioned that also you had been addicted to drugs. The first time you took acid, it precipitated a, a, a panic attack that you said lasted for six months, but you kept taking drugs. So even if we have a bad first moment, it still maybe doesn't teach us, right? What I learned that's kind of self-evident when you take a step back and look at it is that every drug is different. I mean, alcohol is a drug and boy, oh boy, did I love alcohol. Um, marijuana is a drug and I really disliked marijuana. Like I just found it to be kind of slow and gross. It was like putting molasses in my lungs. Whereas the speedy drugs like cocaine and ecstasy, Ooh, I really liked those. Um, Luckily for me, I didn't like opiates that like, I guess I didn't like the slow drugs and I didn't really like the synthetic psychedelic drugs, but you know, cocaine and ecstasy, I really had a great fondness for them. What if I told you that you could feed your dog food that's not only healthier, but also better for the planet? Introducing Earth Animal Wisdom from the Seed Recipe dog food, crafted with care to be healthy for your pet and gentle on the environment. And this complete and balanced formula is carefully air dried at the optimal temperature to preserve vital nutrients. Your dog needs to thrive regardless of their age or size with pure plant nutrition. This is honestly the best vegan dried dog food we have ever tried. It's so easy to purchase too. You're just gonna go to earthanimal.com forward slash switch for good. And then also just simply place switch for good in the discount code box at checkout for 20% off your order. So go run, buy your earth animal. All right, now back to our conversation. Okay, so you're, I see, that makes sense. So you didn't touch acid again, maybe, but um, you, you chose other drugs. And and it's interesting because you had, you, you're a pretty mellow guy, I find when I'm around you, you, you exude a balance, a very balance about you. But yet you struggled with anxiety attacks. It, were the drugs and the alcohol partly trying to deal with those? And how have you dealt with those? Well, yeah, I mean, I've been dealing with anxiety most of my life. Uh, and I guess the two good things about that is it's forced me to develop an arsenal of coping mechanisms. Sometimes I, when, if I'm panicking, sometimes I remember to use them. Sometimes I forget to use them. Uh, but the other thing is it's also given me the ability to at times help other people who are going through panic. Um, Cause panic is such a horrible, pernicious, but fascinating state of neurochemistry because it's so awful and it feels so bad and it's so deeply irrational, but you can even have the presence of mind to recognize that your panic is irrational, but it still has a grip on your brain and, you know, very hard to, to move past it. But luckily everyone does like, you know, panic doesn't, 
it, panic is never eternal. It, it might last for a long time. It might be awful. It might be recurring, but it does abate. And, and can you share some of that arsenal with you, with us? Oh, it's everything from breathing techniques to different types of mindfulness meditation to cognitive behavioral therapy tricks to other types of meditation tricks to music therapy to, uh, I mean, just things I've learned in 12-step programs on and on and on. Like I have this massive arsenal and if I'm having a panic attack, sometimes I just have to remember like, okay, try this approach. And if that doesn't work, try it again or try something else. So you just sort of like go through the grab bag or the toolbox and you try stuff out until the anxiety wanes a little bit. You know, I, wanted to, I want to go back to trust your struggle. There's so much wisdom in that. And as, as it relates to the curiosity, if you will, that still lives inside of me on if a vegan world is ever even possible. Um, I, I, I think, or I know inherently in me, I, I do believe, I don't think this world as we know it will ever not have good and evil. I'm not saying people who eat animals are evil because they're, they're, everybody's on a journey, but the act of causing that much violence and suffering and terror is, is, is evil. And so then I go back a lot of times to the, 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 the work that I do or the work that we do at Switch. And it's like, you know, if this really isn't actually possible, this, this utopia that you're trying to get towards, um, why are you? Why are you fighting? And then I seem to wake up every morning with I the answer of I have an, an inability to not fight. Like I just couldn't, I, I just, I, I, it's, what, it's what I want to do. I don't even know if I could live with myself. But that's a struggle. Do you believe that there's a vegan world in the paradigm of the world that we're on right now on planet earth? Is it possible? It's a wonderful question. And I really, I also wrestle with that question and struggle with that question. Um, the one thing that gives me, well, the many things that give me hope, and of course it is very hard to have hope when confronted with the fact that one trillion animals every year are killed by and for humans. Like hope is, you know, a dropper of water compared to an ocean. But nonetheless, I look back at history and it's funny, I'm gonna name drop for a second. When Cory Booker was elected to the Senate, he called me up, we got on the phone. And the first thing he asked me, he said, what can we do to help animals? So if you ever need a reason to love Cory Booker, there are a million of them, but that the day after he was elected, he asked me that question. And we were talking and we were talking about the, the famous Martin Luther King Jr. quote, you know, the arc of the moral universe is long and it bends towards justice. It also bends towards the right thing. You know, history, if we go back a couple thousand years, like history is slowly bending towards the right thing. And sometimes it happens quickly. Sometimes it happens slowly. I mean, you think of like same-sex marriage, like one minute it was illegal, the next minute it's the law of the land. You know, look at smoking on airplanes. When I was growing up, everybody smoked on airplanes and all of a sudden, nothing. Look at the Civil Rights Act, like the integration of the military, it happened overnight. The end of the Soviet Union, you know, like, like when I was growing up, I never thought that cigarette smoking would be banned in public places, that same-sex couples would be allowed to get married, that we'd have a black president that the Soviet Union would end, like these seemed in the realm of impossible and they happen. You know, the same way that like in the United States for the longest time, women thought they'd never be allowed to vote. Then now we look back and it just seems ridiculous that there was ever a time when 51% of the population wasn't allowed to vote. Uh, so I, I look at history and I look at the trajectory and realization of other social movements. And I have to hope and think that animal rights is going to be similar, that 
I mean, it's hard. It's, it's a really hard one because obviously it touches every part of people's lives, but who knows? I mean, maybe it's similar to the Soviet Union is like once it started ending, it ended quick. Like the, the dominoes just fell. It wasn't a gradual thing. It was, it fell very quickly. And I have to hope that like meat and dairy production, leather production, wool and animal product production and testing on animals at some point, humanity to survive has to step back and say, oh, these things don't, not only are they not, they're, they're cruel, they also don't make sense. They're bad science, it's bad nutrition, it's bad everything. And it's not, it's not who we are ultimately. It's like who we might be in the moment, but it's you know the same way like owning slaves and denying women the right to vote and denying same-sex couples the right to get married. Like, that's not who we're supposed to be. It just takes us a while to figure that out. I get frustrated with the new, I mean, all of those examples you gave, it's like, and then new evils popped up afterwards, you know, like now we have vaping to replace and now we don't have body autonomy anymore. And now we don't, that's where it's like, is the e right. But I, I hear you. And I, it, it does seem at some point, like there might be a critical mass where it just, there's a recognition that this just can't continue anymore. Even Yeah. I mean, and also as we, as we know, if if humans continue on this current course, there simply won't be humanity anymore. You know, it's like if we don't have a course correction, I mean, the choice is either course correction and a sustainable future or no course correction and basically the end of civilization and culture. You're right, because with the big things like antibiotic resistance and um, uh, something like uh, uh, HN, you know, some kind H1N1, of- H1N1, yeah. Thank you, H1N1, um, or just the destruction, the climate change. Those are all huge issues that can be rectified if we stop exploiting animals. Um, and they're huge. And so maybe a huge, a big scare like that will change us since we were able to get rid of slavery, which was very ba much based on economics. And this whole animal thing is based very much on economics. Yeah, I I completely agree. And I 100% with every fiber of my being hope that you're right. I mean, that is one of the challenges of being an animal rights activist is I don't know if you guys had this experience, but when you first go vegan, when you first discover the truth, you go to everyone, you're like, hey, by the way, did you know that animal ag causes climate change and antibiotic resistance and pandemics, and it also kills animals? And you expect people to say, no, I didn't know that, but now that I do, I will change my diet. And people instead look at you like, it's the weirdest thing. Like you can go to someone and say, would you ever hurt an animal? And they're like, oh, absolutely not. And they're like, would you ever want to see footage of an animal being hurt? And they'll, they'll be horrified. They might even start crying or throwing up. But then you say, okay, well, stop supporting the torture and death of animals. And that's when they yell at you or punch you in the face. And they're like, but, but you just said the idea of animal suffering, you, you can't look at an image of an animal suffering, but you eat the dead bodies of animals who someone else killed how, like it's the the cognitive distance is it, I, I there it's it's very hard for any of us to live in a world and live with that cognitive dissonance. Yeah, it's a, it's alive and well. I know we have listeners because they write to us sometimes who struggle, you know, right with family and friends like we all have or still do. Or I don't feel like I struggle as much because you just in it long enough and you just recognize uh, you, you know humanity and and. Um, get crafty too on on finding out more about the people that you're talking to, and the more information they give, the more that gives us a kind of just kind of a little bit of a cheat sheet on what they might lean into listening to. But has has you you've been an activist for a very long time now? Has has your activism ever um, conflicted with, let's say, a personal relationship or even a a professional endeavor? And were those some light bulb moments for you on how to I don't know. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. funny that you mentioned that because um, something I've been thinking about for a while now is the psychology of animal rights activists. 
And, and I don't have, all I can say is most of the animal rights activists I know were generally speaking, maybe this is a terrible thing and I shouldn't say it, generally speaking, we're kind of okay losing relationships and even losing family members or alienating work. Like we're weirdly okay with the isolation that comes from animal rights activism. Um, so it's almost, I wonder if there is like a psychological component because a lot of times when I talk to non-vegans, they're like, oh, I would love to go vegan, but I can't offend my family. And honestly, my response is like, fuck my family. If they can't handle it, that's not my problem. And, but that's my psyche and maybe your guys as well and a bunch of the listeners, the people who perhaps are a little more attached to relationships and friends and family. Like, I think I have to have more understanding for them. Like I'm just wired differently where it, it never crossed my mind to, and I'm not saying this is a virtue. I'm saying it's a weirdness. If anything is like, it never crossed my mind to attenuate my beliefs in the interest of having more friends or family or career. Like it just wouldn't even cross my mind, but I don't think that's a good thing necessarily. It's just the weirdness of how I'm wired. It just shows that your morality and your values are very important and that you don't want to compromise with them. I, I see it as a very good thing, Moby, um, actually, that you just have values that you feel like you're not telling other people how to be. You're just being who you are and not letting um, them dictate that, don't you think? Um, I mean, I, because <laughs> I've only ever been one person, at least that I'm aware of. So this is the only, we'll call it like synaptic neural orientation I've ever had. So I don't know what it feels like to not be wired this way. So to me, and also it, it make, just makes so much sense. As we were talking about, as you guys know, and I apologize for stating the obvious, but like you look at meat and dairy and leather production, et cetera. And you're like, but it kills the animals, makes the animals suffer, destroys the workers, destroys communities, destroys water, causes the antibiotic resistance, causes pandemics, cancer, diabetes, heart disease. Maybe we should stop doing this. Like to me, that's just, it's so basic and obvious that I still to this day don't understand how people are aware of that, but un are unwilling to change how they live. Well, don't you think that actually as someone who it's an addiction, um, as someone who actually was vegetarian since age 14, but didn't become vegan until uh, a, a, till 33 years later, although I had given up a lot, no, I wasn't wearing things or using makeup, uh, wearing leather or anything, but I still had dairy in my diet. Um, don't you think it's that same mentality of addiction where we, we know it, but we we don't do it so knowing is not the the answer it's a step it's a step and it's important but it's not everything oh yeah and we're all like i don't know if, like for example you're familiar with the indian religion of jainism but as we know like the jains were so wonderfully committed to protecting and respecting life that they would sweep the ground in front of them to protect life but obviously Jainism was invented before the dawn of the microscope because every time you get in the shower, we're, you're killing millions and millions of microorganisms. Every time you garden, every time we drive, every time we get on a bicycle, we can't not, the only way to not kill things is to die. Um, and, you know, I think of like getting in a car and driving to a vegan restaurant. I'm like, okay, well, how many bugs have I just killed? How many, you know, like how many little things have I just killed because I'm choosing to, to get in my car and drive to a vegan restaurant? So that hopefully prevents me from ever trying to like be holier than thou. Cause I'm like, oh, there is no way to be holier than thou. There's just, there are ways to make better choices, I think. And a lot of people won't get there, but a lot of people, like all of us, like none, we, we weren't born vegan unless you're Joaquin Phoenix. And so we, you know, we do our best with the information that's available to us. And I hope that that's going to, you know, ultimately the case for other people as well. 
how do you communicate the importance of uh, being kind to animals and maybe even eating differently without being preachy in, in all the ways of your life as an, as an artist and also personally? Well, it's, yeah, it's a wonderful question because, you know, having been an animal rights activist and a vegan for 37 years, I think I went through the period that a lot of people go through. When I first went vegan, I wanted to be a revolutionary. I wanted to like burn down fur stores and throw Molotov cocktails through Burger King windows and throw fake blood on people wearing fur. But then you realize, okay, that might be satisfying and dramatic, but is it helping the animals? Is it moving the needle? And so I guess over time, I've tried to figure out like the only criteria for animal rights activism is does it help animals? Does it move the needle? And my, how I feel about it doesn't matter that much. What's important is keeping my eye on that prize of trying to help animals. And so if I go up to a friend of mine who's eating a bacon double cheeseburger and scream at them, they're not going to change. They're just going to be mad at me. And so I, it's finding that day in day out balance of like speaking your truth and living your truth and being honest like you, you can't lie down and say nothing but you also don't want to scream at someone and make them defensive so it's just i'm sure you guys deal with that and the listeners deal with that as well like finding the balance that leads to some version of effective activism the thing is is that people anything that vegans say comes they if, if it was about an environmental issue or civil rights issue, people wouldn't take offense, but it's really easy for vegans. Like everybody is on guard. And I'm, I imagine that in your creativity, whether it's in your songs or your, your movie that's coming out about animal rights called Tessie, that you really try hard to get a message across. But, and if it was about environmentalism, people wouldn't be on you like you're too preachy. But when it's animals, animal rights, everyone just thinks you're super preachy. And if you just change the word to the climate, people wouldn't think you were preachy. Do you, have you found that? Cause I've found Oh, that. absolutely. A hundred percent. Yeah. And it's, but, and then of course the irony there is they all agree with us. Like, like even the people who like, as we were saying earlier, like even the people who think we're being preachy or strident, like they don't want to hurt animals. They don't want to kill animals. They just want someone else to do it so they can eat them. And so they all, that, that's the irony of being an animal rights activist. Everybody already agrees with us. The only difference is they're unwilling to change their behavior. And so it's a very hard thing to make sense of. Um, I mean, I remember when the pandemic started and slaughterhouse workers were considered essential workers, you know, and of course they were being treated terribly. They were being exposed to COVID, they were dying, um, but they were considered essential workers. And I think I saw some graphic that someone made for social media and it said, if you kill a dog, you're either a researcher or a serial killer. If you, you know, if you kill a pig, you're either a statist and a psychopath or an essential worker. Um, it's how do we make sense of that? Like there's there's just no rational logic to it. That the the same action, you know, like if you're at the FBI and if you want to, if you're doing a test of someone to find out if they're a psychopath or a serial killer, the first question is, did you, do you enjoy killing animals? Did you kill animals when you were young? You know, first test for finding out if someone is a psychopath or has antisocial personality disorder. But then the other question is, oh, you, you torture and kill animals? Wow, thank you for being a researcher. How do, how do we make sense? Like, imagine if, there was an entire industry in, in the United States where people were praised for being pedophiles and researching on babies. You know, like how we, we, we would be horrified, but somehow that's the status quo when it comes to animals. Like we're horrified by people who torture animals, 
but at the same time we celebrate people who torture and kill animals like i don't i I just don't ever know how to wrap my head around that yeah it is hard for me to understand how people um could consciously close their eyes to the truth and i i've been grappling with that recently and 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 just thinking okay i know so you know most people uh, not all, but most people, I mean, it's just, they're tired, they're weary, they're busy, they're overwhelmed, they're stressed. There's just a lot of negatives. Um, and that makes them not necessarily want to look at the truth because the truth in our world of animal rights is, is super, super traumatic and ugly and awful to look at. So they don't want any more awful in their lives. They sort of know what they might find. And so I was looking in my own life, uh, where am I closing my eyes to the truth? There has to be something. I'm sure there's many things. Um, and I started thinking about um, child labor and who's making my clothes. Cause I'm not walking around in, um, you know, only cotton. We had somebody recently that has a clothing company, uh, California cloth foundry, and she was so illuminating. Um, I don't know who the hell made the shirt. I don't know who made the hat. I don't know who made my shorts. And I was like, I am actively pursuing not looking at the truth. I guarantee you there's hundreds and hundreds of undercover videos on child labor that I could go find. And that really like helped me to see why people are not going to look for the truth. They don't want to change. They don't want to change their lives. They're too overwhelmed, too weary, too busy. I think that's how I feel about the child labor and where am I going to get my clothes now? It's like one more thing to figure out how to do differently. And I'm just, uh, maybe some of it's laziness, but I think it's more weariness and busyness. I mean, I think it's wonderful to apply that scrutiny to ourselves and to our actions and our choices. Um, the one thing like I had to learn during the pandemic was what's the utility or the virtue in getting upset about something I can't change? You know, like, for example, I would read these stories about people in Northern Europe and people all over the world stuck in apartments and it's cold and they're sick and people are dying around them. I'd get upset and I'd be like, but there's nothing I can do. And I'd feel guilty. I'd go out hiking. I live right by Griffith Park. I'd go hiking in the sunshine. I'd be like, oh, Am I allowed to be happy hiking in the sunshine when people are suffering? I'm like, but there's nothing I can do about it. So give, and I tried to give myself the license, just be like, okay, my hiking doesn't impact them in the, in the slightest. So, but the other thing I'll say is, for example, like child labor in manufacturing, it's horrible across the board. That is a, that is a bad, evil thing. Um, but we can't, I don't think we can know because one thing I learned in my limited bit of research around that is, for example, imagine you buy clothing that's assembled in the United States in ethical ways, where it's like a worker owned factory, but like, where does the cotton come from? Where does the thread come from? Where do the labels come from? Where does this come from? Where is it packaged? Where is it this? I, I'm not saying it excuses, it means we should ignore it, but I'm just saying like every single thing on the planet, any consumer good is the product of probably like a hundred different supply chains, the majority of which are deeply unethical. And the only other thing I'll say is I think, for example, meat, unless you're eating an animal that died of natural causes, meat can't be produced ethically like it involves murder it involves torture and death like even people who are like oh but i raised this cow and i killed it myself it's like well you still killed it it didn't want to die it didn't you know it didn't throw itself on the knife like you had to inflict horrible violence and and suffering on this animal so you can have an ethically produced t-shirt or you can have an unethically produced t-shirt. Sometimes we won't know the difference. You can't have ethically produced meat because it's all the product of torture and murder. Yeah, but I mean, the point is I could do better. 
I'm choosing to not do better in that category. Maybe somebody doesn't become completely vegan and they can do a hell of a lot better because they know, and I'd be happy if they just, you know, stopped it five days a week or something. And I'm realizing that I'm not looking deeply at the truth in that category. Um, I, I, I think it's because I just don't want to make another change and not also, just, you know, I, I, yeah. Also in terms of clothing, I don't know how easy it is to do better. Cause for years, like going on tour, I've been involved in producing merchandise, t-shirts, et cetera. And it's this ongoing question. You know, when you talk to merchandise companies, you'd be like, okay, how was this manufactured? Is the cotton organic? Where do the inks come from? And eventually you realize no one knows, you know, like, for example, like, I really appreciate the company Patagonia, you know, the, the owner is very progressive and does all these pro environmental things, but they still make leather. They still make wool. They still, they're they still live plucking. Unethical. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's, I'm like, how, so how do you like in the world of fashion, I would love for someone to maybe sit me down and explain how you can actually have 100% ethically produce fashion or consumer goods or shoes or computers like everything is the product of horrible processes so i th that's why the i will carve out no pun intended meat and dairy because they're always bad you know there isn't a good way to produce them i want to just divert a little bit and ask you how do you take care of yourself nowadays like how do you eat how do you exercise what are your health what are what are some of the things that keep you balanced so that you feel like your your best self and not somebody who you used to be where who who needed to soothe themselves with drugs and alcohol and um fame you know outside um love yeah that i mean so it's it's very it's a wonderful thing to talk about um and for me, there first and foremost, there has to be the willingness to look at the consequences of actions. You know, a classic example is my phone and social media. You know, like there's a part of me that wants to be on social media, check it 80 times a day. But I learned if I do that, I will go insane. And so I so now my discipline is I look at it once a day for 10 minutes. That's it. That's my discipline. And because more than that, it starts to make me crazy. And so it's learning through experience what, what works, what's healthy, what's sustainable. And exercise is a very essential. I know you guys live in that world as well. It's like exercise and going out into nature and going hiking and climbing mountains. And that is, that's my church. That's my, you know, like uh, if, if ever... I'm spinning out in my brain. All I need to do, go for a long walk in nature and everything gets centered. Um, and in addition to that, you know, of course I'm a vegan and I pretty much only eat organic food and I have, you know, 20 to 30 different types of plants in my diet every day. And it's high in fiber and macronutrients, micronutrients, et cetera, et cetera. So the awareness of that and also the awareness of, what brings joy and what brings health and what depletes it, you know? And so I don't want to completely state, like, for example, I hate airports and I don't really like crowded places and I don't like shopping malls. So as a result, I try not to go to those places. I don't have a panic attack if I have to go to a shopping mall but I'm certainly like, if I have some time off, I'm not going to go wander around a shopping mall looking for health and well-being. <laughs> Somehow I knew that was probably not what you would do to look for a solace. <laughs> Tell us about yeah. your upcoming tour and your upcoming movie. I hate touring and my manager tricked me because he knew that the only way he could get me to tour was if I give the money to animal rights organizations. So I'm doing a brief tour of Europe and the money, the profits are going to animal rights organizations. I really, I hate touring. I don't want to go, but it's a way of drawing attention to these organizations and raising some money for them. Um, and regarding the movie, so uh, I just finished 
producing my first scripted feature. It's called Tessie. You mentioned it earlier. And we have an amazing cast and amazing director. Everybody involved is amazing. And it's inspired by, it's basically a tragic romance in the Los Angeles animal rights community. So it's looking at like these young, beautiful, principled, funny activists. And luckily everyone involved in the movie, the actors, the craft services, the catering, the wardrobe, everybody's vegan. So when we when the movie is released and we at the end we say no animals were harmed in the making of this movie, we mean it, including also wardrobe and catering. Nice, nice. Congratulations. So tell us when the movie's coming out, if you know. I suppose it might be too early to know that, but and also when are you going on tour? So people you said you mentioned um before the show that it was sold out, but who knows? They can hang out outside and watch you walk in. So the movie, hopefully next year at some point, I don't know, because we just started editing the movie and the tour, there are actually, I think it's London, we're playing at the O2 Arena, and I think there are a few tickets left there. And then the last show is in Lausanne, Switzerland. And the same thing, I think, so the the London show and the Lausanne show are both around like 98% sold out. So there's still a couple of tickets at each. Thank you for sharing creativity, nature, and animals. Uh, I really, I appreciate you being here and uh, go do something amazing with whatever you're doing right now. 145. Well, and thank you. Thank you guys for doing what you're doing. This was really, it was a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. It, was. it truly was.